In typical Tomb Raider fashion, the third installment of the series opens with a flashback. In pre-Pleistocene age Antarctica, at a time when this currently coldest of continents was a flourishing tropical paradise, a meteorite crashes into the middle of a jungle, annihilating everything in its path. Millions of years into the future, in 1998, an international team of scientists employed by the RX Tech Mining Corporation is taking geological samples in the continent's icy wasteland. Under the leadership of a Dr. Mark Willard, the team is working to unearth whatever remains of the meteorite. I've been yelling myself hoarse on this radio every day. It's just the weather dumps on us frequently here. And maybe my transmission doesn't get through. I don't know. I can't understand one word of what you say, Willard. It's all going swell, sir. <laughs> Get the bit up! Get it out! Turn it off! Off! Hey! Switch it off! I think you better come and check out site two. Dr. Willard is presented with a stunning view. Monolithic Polynesian monuments in the form of human heads, identical to the famous Moai on Easter Island in the South Pacific. However, the Polynesian remains are not the only ones at the dig site. A grave cross for a British sailor from the famous HMS Beagle named Paul Caulfield marks the spot he was buried in the 19th century. This place is a busy history. At the other end of the Indian Ocean, far away from the freezing cold, adventurer Lara Croft finds herself in the jungles of India. The game does not tell us exactly where this hidden tropical forest is situated. It is devoid of present-day humanity, but is littered with ancient temple ruins. However, there are several hints as to where Miss Croft could possibly be located. In 1996, two years earlier, at the beginning of the debut title Tomb Raider, we met Lara in the Imperial Hotel in Calcutta, where she may have been preparing for her trek into the Indian jungle. She was, of course, interrupted by Larson Conway and subsequently hired for an entirely different voyage altogether. Moreover, the forest covers a considerable area of an arm of the Ganges River, which further narrows down the options for its geographical position. 
With these points in mind, we are able to place the jungle somewhere in the Indian state of West Bengal, with its capital, Calcutta. The province is home to India's half of the Ganges Delta, the other half belonging to the neighbouring country, Bangladesh. The region is made up of vast stretches of swamps and wetlands, lakes and channels. Lara is making her way through the muddy thicket in search of yet another mysterious ancient artefact. A beautifully carved rock called the Infada Stone, supposedly named after a fictional local Indian tribe rooted in this very jungle. We do not know how the adventurer found out about the stone or its possible whereabouts. In fact, we don't know anything about the artefact or the significance of its home tribe. All we know is that Miss Croft is determined to locate the object. Within the rainforest, Lara navigates through a plethora of long abandoned ruined structures, such as temples, hallways and courtyards. The ruins, perhaps once belonging to an ancient city, stretch out through a large portion of the jungle. Some of them are submerged in swampland or water from the nearby river, while others are overgrown with dense vines and mangroves. There is no telling exactly which Indian civilization these architectural remnants belong to, as there are only a very few cultural artworks and stylistic elements to be found among the ruins. The most prominent icon that Lara comes across is that of two female dancing figures carved into the temple walls. These dancers are known as Apsaras. They are celestial spirits in Hindu Buddhist mythology, usually depicted with prominent feminine features and accessorized with excessive jewelry. Images of these beautiful supernatural maidens can be found en masse adorning Asian and Southeast Asian Hindu and Buddhist temples, but are something of a rarity in northern India. Another artwork seen on the walls of the temple ruins is that of a person riding an elephant. This seems to be based on a real-life carving at the so-called Temple of the Tooth in the city of Kandy on the island of Sri Lanka. Elephants have been depicted by almost all civilizations inhabiting India, going back as far as the Indus Valley Civilization. In addition to mundane elephants, there are also carvings of the elephant-headed god, Ganesh, one of the most popular and widely worshipped deities depicted in Hindu art. Another animal found among the ruins is the Yali, a mysterious creature from Hindu mythology. It is commonly portrayed as part lion, part elephant and part horse, and is usually seen in South Indian temple architecture and sculpture. The general architecture of the structures encountered by our adventurer is hard to identify, given the blocky art style of the game. That being said, there are distinguishable architectural elements present in walls, pillars and gates. These, in addition to the prominent Hindu Buddhist artworks, suggest the high to late Middle Ages, from the 11th to the 15th century CE. For now, the medieval date stamping of these edifices shall suffice. Our focus is not on the architecture, but on the previously mentioned Infada stone. Just like Lara, we will learn more about this artifact shortly as her trek into the uncharted jungle continues. Hello? Hello? What? What do you want from me now? Nothing that taxing. Are you all right? Well, if you'd all stop, I might be just fine. Just a hundred percent. Just go! If you'd all stop, who are you talking about? All you, hundreds of you, talking and chattering and breaking my brain up. Hmm. Well, I'm not quite sure where you're coming from. 
But I just want to know about the Infada after that. In the temple up there. <laughs> voodoo magic and all, huh? I don't touch the stuff myself. It's not voodoo. Look, is there anyone else here with you? Yeah, Randy and Rory. <laughs> Randy and Rory? Where? What are you all doing here? Well, they're staying put in that temple. I told them not to. I warned them first. Not doing much now, I doubt, under half a ton of mudslide. Me. I'm leaving. Next bus out. This jungle is rooted enough rot into me. I'd offer the same advice to you, but you don't seem like the type to take it. To care if I said you're gonna die in there. <laughs> yeah. Die. After a surprising encounter with a peculiar scientist named Tony, who has just abandoned his operation, Lara decides to head towards the nearby temple ruins where Tony and his team have made camp. The fauna in the rainforest ranges from Bengal tigers and macaques to venomous Indian cobras and piranhas. Our explorer meets all of them on her way to the aforementioned temple, and some are hungry enough to try and take a bite out of her. After a short trek, she manages to arrive at her overgrown destination. This large Hindu temple complex which is surprisingly intact with only a few areas of structural damage, is located in the heart of the rainforest, in the centre of what remains of the once great city. The deeper Lara delves into the ruins, the more obvious it becomes that this location is entirely abandoned and uninhabited. There is no sign of the Infada tribe, or any other human life for that matter. The accessible halls and ritual chambers are empty, and no one has set foot in them in hundreds of years. Could the Infada artifact still be here? Did the tribespeople relocate and take the stone with them? It isn't until our treasure hunter encounters something terrifying in one of the dark halls of the temple's sanctuary as she approaches a larger-than-life-sized, sword-wielding statue it comes to life. Kali, whose Sanskrit name translates to she who is black or she who is death, is the major Hindu goddess of time and death. Her mythology also commonly embodies themes of sexuality and violence. It stands to reason that this temple was dedicated to Kali, as this statue is not the only one located here. Were the statue's once mundane artworks merely depicting the goddess before the power of the Infada artifact corrupted them and elevated them to reflect their true divine nature? Did they ultimately cause the demise of the tribe or force them to abandon this temple? When Lara arrives at a big hall with a skylight overgrown with shrubs and vines, she finds two bodies. These are the remains of Randy and Rory, the two explorers from Tony's team that he mentioned earlier in his conversation with Lara. When examined closer, it becomes apparent that they have been gruesomely slaughtered. This was no doubt the work of one of the possessed Kali statues. <gasps> Leaving the temple behind empty-handed, and exiting it through a corridor leading back into the jungle, Lara runs into Tony once more.
The corrupted scientist is floating downstream, and at last we know the truth. The Infada Stone was not taken from the temple. The object stuck in Tony's chest is the artifact. He must have left the temple ruins just before Lara and taken the stone with him. Since the temple was entirely devoid of humans and there was no sign of the Infada tribe anywhere nearby, we can only conclude that the statues must have driven them out, guarding the powerful stone with their, well, lives. With no time to lose, our treasure hunter hops onto the researcher's abandoned quad bike to chase Mad Tony down the Ganges. Tony does not get very far. The slender river comes to an end in a steep waterfall. At the bottom, Lara finds Tony's broken raft and behind it, a narrow entrance to a cave. <laughs> Under the mind and body altering influence of the artifact, the scientist has retreated into the caves behind the waterfall likely driven by madness and with no clear goal in mind. Considering that Tony was not the most mentally stable of people to start with when Lara first encountered him, it is safe to assume that the Infada Stone only accelerated his descent into madness and has completely destroyed his sanity. Our adventurer follows him into the caves and discovers an ancient network of stone hallways Navigating the eerie, labyrinth-like caves, it becomes clear that they must have once have been part of the city above ground, or, more specifically, the temple itself. When she finally reaches the heart of the maze, Lara catches up to Tony. He has utterly lost his mind and attacks her on sight. He uses the strange powers of the artifact he has control of and shoots fireballs at our heroine. Lara doesn't hesitate to return the compliment with her own weapons and finally puts him out of his misery. His body implodes and he vanishes in a burst of fire, leaving nothing but the Infada stone behind. This unassuming, conical-shaped and elaborately decorated artifact is truly powerful and immensely dangerous. So, naturally, Lara takes it home with her. Or at least, that was the plan. I don't want to be misrepresented by that retarded research you've just been with. Uh, Lara. I'm Dr. Willard. I'd come to converse with Tony myself, but I saw you were doing a rather more creditable job, I think. Indeed, I'm inspired. I'd like to offer you other work. What? Shoot the breeze with some of your other boys? No thanks. Fortunately, they were the only lab rats we let loose into the field. No. My request is for three other artifacts like this. The Infada tribe only had one artifact of this type. It's unique. Anyway, what would your interest in it be? I'll show you. It's not from India, rather an island near Antarctica. It is in fact meteorite rock that has been fashioned and used by Polynesians who were once settled there many, many years ago. See that? That's unique, an unknown material. So how did it end up here? Formed from the planets, sculpted by Polynesians, distributed by goons. Our excavations and investigations have led us to this. A sailor's diary from Charles Darwin's expedition on the HMS Beagle. August 14th, 1834. This voyage is getting too boring for me to go on with this journal. Me adventures at sea are an embarrassment. The only tales I'll have to tell are hours of bird watching, picking and pressing flowers, following them blasphemous ideas of the governor, Darwin. But this don't even concern me now. I just want food. 
Something more than vegetable broth in me. Today we five have made a pact. The only sampling we're going to be doing is for meat. Pure, solid, blood-rich meat. The snow's run out. The tracks have gone. Just keep going. We're on its trail. Better say nothing about this to the governor, else we'll be back having to hunt down that creature for his samples. Paul fell down a crevasse, okay? Okay, Stephen. Amen. Stephen was to be the only survivor of the four. When he arrived back in London, he superstitiously sold off his artifact, having seen his pals murdered or killed with theirs. One here in India, one in the South Pacific, and one in Nevada. The place is where I'd like you to go. Sounds good to me. After our treasure hunter agrees to locate the three other meteoric artifacts for her new commissioner, Dr. Willard, she travels back to her home country to track down the artifact that HMS Beagle sailor Stephen Barr brought back home with him. On a rainy night on the gloomy rooftops of London, Lara is trying to get her bearings. She has discovered that Stephen Barr's meteoric artifact ended up in the capital when he returned from the Beagle's voyage around the world. It somehow found its way into the British Museum not long after his death, but this is not where Lara is headed. Rumour has it that the diamond-shaped stone, commonly referred to as the Eye of Isis for unknown reasons, is in the possession of Sophia Lee, the head of SL Incorporated, a major London-based cosmetics company. The cosmetics giant may have stolen the artifact from the museum herself, or acquired it through shady black market deals. Either way, Lara is determined to get her hands on it. Now somewhere opposite the famous St Paul's Cathedral on Ludgate Hill, our treasure hunter explores the surrounding areas, planning her next move. Her goal? to break into Lee's headquarters and steal the stone from right under her nose. Lara is not the only one out on the rooftops on this murky night. She's attacked by heavily armed men in bulletproof vests, including a sniper positioned on top of St Paul's Cathedral. She heads over to the cathedral's roof via a large crane to interrogate her attacker. Who are you 
working for. What? You heard me. I didn't. Honest. What did you say? I said, who employs you? Ah! Miss Sophia Lee! <coughs> Who's she? What does she do? I don't know. Really, I don't. I just shoot people for her. A commendable work ethic, I guess. <sighs> yeah. I put me hours into it. As my father did and his father did her for. Well, how old is this, Miss Lee? I don't know. Late 20s? Early 30s? Right. Yeah. For some people, like yourself, we get a special bonus. I'm flattered. I mean, I could even be retiring from you. Then you might like to mind. <laughs> the bell. <laughs> Happy retirement. Now that the mysterious and very possessive Sophia Lee is expecting her, Lara continues her mission. She makes her way from the top of St. Paul's Cathedral all the way underground into the abandoned Aldwych Underground Station. Opened in 1907 as the Strand Station, Aldwych Underground Station once served as the terminus of a short branch of the Piccadilly Line. During the Second World War, Parts of the station were used as an air raid shelter, as well as a shelter for artworks and paintings from museums. The station was ultimately closed in 1994, when repair costs became too high. It has since been abandoned. When Lara descends into the station, she is ambushed by masked GAN members. Hey. Uh. They are equipped with spiked clubs and torches, and wear jackets embroidered with the word DAMNED in capital letters. She fends off her attackers, and follows them further into the depths of the run-down tunnels. Hidden away behind a multitude of corridors and pathways, our adventurer also discovers an exciting curiosity. A secret Masonic temple, beautifully furnished and definitely not abandoned. Members of the Fraternal Freemason organization must still use this underground hall, a common location within Freemasonry and the meeting point of the Masonic Lodge for their gatherings. Moving on, and leaving this accidental discovery to its rightful owners, Lara ventures forth and locates the hideout of the gang that has been pursuing her through the tunnels. So, you must be after Miss Lee then? Business, not pleasure. Though obviously not for revenge, man. You've hardly got the face for that. And you have? <laughs> How moronic a question is that, eh? I don't even have a face, man! I came down here looking for work. And what do I get, eh? But Miss Lee's cosmetic company and her lab assistant job. No experience necessary. Good wage. Accommodation with it. Aye. Locked in a flotation tank for days on end, in some fetid syrup. And when we come out, cos lots of us applied like, no face or flesh, man. And a bootin' doing the waste disposal shoot here. Presumed deed. Some kind of failed experiment, then? Oh, ta, very much. But I, and for added insult, when I tried to take my own life, I found it just didn't work. You mean Sophia's testing some sort of immortality power? Along with her own brand of facelift. Why aye, man. Everlasting beauty. She's obviously not fully worked it out yet, but she takes the best results for herself. See, I don't care what your business with her is. You can't be any more shiftless than what she is. So I'm going to go out of my way to help you. That is, after you've done something for us here, Lake. Very generous of you. What do you want? A bottle of that mummy preservation stuff from the Natural History Museum. 
Embalming fluid? Aye, for rotten flesh you can't whack it, man. The museum's pretty interesting, I'm told. You'll like it. So why don't you go yourself? One of them Egyptian lassies there is a bit pissed off, like, that uh, she didn't get immortality the way she wanted it. And seeing as we've done better than her in that department, I didn't care to imagine what curse we could get given any worse than what we've got already, like. You'll be fine, though, pet. You die easily. Thanks. Having discovered yet another piece of the truth behind the ruthless Sophia Lee, and perhaps now feeling a twinge of pity for the social rejects that had previously tried to kill her, Lara agrees to assist the damned in exchange for their help. Bob, the leader of the damned, requests Lara fetch some embalming fluid from the National History Museum to aid their disfiguring ailment. However, it is unlikely that this is the right museum. The National History Museum is about an hour to the west of where Lara is currently located and is in no way reachable from the underground station. In the game, however, the gang's lair inside Oldwich seems to be directly connected to the museum above, but this is certainly not the case in real life. It is much more likely that Bob was talking about the British Museum, not the National History Museum. Unlike the National History, the British Museum holds a large ancient Egyptian exhibition and is a lot closer to Aldwych and St Paul's Cathedral on Ludgate Hill. While it isn't directly connected to any of these places, it is definitely a lot easier to travel to from Lara's present location. Perhaps for the sake of playability and simplicity, the developers decided not to branch out too much and instead kept all the relevant locations in one place. Either way, Lara breaks into the British Museum through some sort of sewer into a basement or storage area. From there, she makes her way past the Night Watch Guard into a grand hall with our gargantuan Sphinx. Could this be the very same one Lara discovered on one of her previous adventures on her travels through Egypt? Years prior, our treasure hunter found a sphinx in the sanctuary of the submerged lost city of Kamun. Perhaps, once this news reached the rest of the world, the already disintegrating sphinx was disassembled for protection and removed from the unsafe Egyptian cavern, so it could be reassembled in the museum. Doing so was obviously a risky move, as its face shows signs of further damage. Exploring the famous Egyptian exhibition, Lara finally locates the embalming fluid, along with two ancient sarcophagi. After this short excursion, and after delivering the remedy to her temporary allies, the damned lead our adventurer to a secret tunnel. The shaft takes her all the way to the top of the SL Incorporated skyscraper, straight into Miss Lee's office. Ah, Miss Croft. I take it you're ready to sign on. To what? Well, my books. You see, with your lifestyle, you'd be the perfect campaign for my products. Just think. You wouldn't be needing those unsightly weapons anymore. No, but I'll probably have an unsightly face, judging by your past experiments. My what? Oh yes, they're all still alive. Very much so, in fact. All I want is the artifact. <laughs> right, in your next life. We'll see. Lara chases the fleeing businesswoman to the helipad on the tower's roof, where Sophia Lee is prepared to take off after disposing of the intruder. Using the power of the meteoric artifact in a similar way to how Tony used the Infada stone back in India, Sophia tries to shoot at Lara from a distance. However, our protagonist catches up to Miss Lee and electrocutes her by shooting at a junction box. And just like that, Another meteoric artifact changes hands.
The next artifact on Lara's agenda has been tracked by Dr. Willard to Nevada, USA. Although Willard mentioned that most of the meteoric rocks remained where the sailors had taken them before they were murdered or died, this one is probably an exception. Our treasure hunter isn't headed for a simple cave or an old building. Far from it. She is going to break into Area 51. An insane task for an even more insane woman. Located in the barren deserts of Nevada, the infamous United States Air Force facility Area 51, which is actually called Homey Airport or Groom Lake, is most likely a center for the development and testing of experimental aircraft. The development of an airbase in the area around the Groom Lake salt flats started in the early 1940s, advanced in the 1950s, and reached its peak during the Cold War. Countless myths, urban legends, governmental conspiracies and obscure stories surround the airbase and almost exclusively revolve around extraterrestrials. They certainly appear to still be covering up what exactly goes on at Area 51. If you and I walked in on everything that was being done, I'm sure we, we would be flabbergasted. Just the type of stories, in fact, that the concealment of a lost and highly powerful piece of meteoric rock would fit into. Dr. Willard and Lara are set on proving that it is more than just a story. While you can drive up several roads towards the facility, there comes a point at which big stop signs tell you to do just that. Each of the roads leading to the Air Force installation are guarded by a private security company hired by the government. Among other things, photography of the area is strictly prohibited. The use of deadly force from security, however, is authorised. Everything beyond the very clear warning signs is a restricted area. With this in mind, Lara opts for a less direct approach. The same strategy she used when acquiring Sophia Lee's artefact. A short distance from Area 51, and partially hidden in a canyon, our treasure hunter scouts out another, smaller, military base. This small facility is related to its big sister base out in the desert. Lara's plan is to cross the canyon and infiltrate the base. From there, she can sneak a ride on a military supply convoy that runs between the two stations. On her way through the mountainous region, she comes upon venomous rattlesnakes and a couple of large New World vultures. On finding a quad bike, she decides upon a less time-consuming and more theatrical entrance. Crazy geek freak. What kind of stunt is that to pull? Let's take her in. <laughs> she don't look much like one of them. Maybe she's an eco-terrorist or something. And they wear hot pants, huh? After the security personnel lock the intruder up in a jail cell, Lara notices she is not the only prisoner at the facility. The military police have brought her to a high-security compound within the military base. Lara tricks one of the guards into entering her holding cell, where she then ambushes and rushes past him. And so, her exploration of the premises begins.
Making her way past security guards and workers while trying to stay hidden, our adventurer eventually arrives in a courtyard. Here there are several cargo trucks parked in front of a large hall, where they are loaded and unloaded by the base's workers. The hall holds countless boxes and storage crates, probably filled to the brim with military equipment and other supplies for Area 51. Lara sneaks into the cargo area of the truck that is conveniently about to leave and takes a well-deserved break on her way to the top-secret Air Force Base. The plan worked, and our treasure hunter is delivered directly into the cargo area of Area 51. Without being detected, she manages to leave the truck and explore her surroundings. The deeper she descends into the facility, the heavier security becomes. Avoiding deadly lasers, turrets, barbed wire and armed military personnel, she finally arrives in the center of the installation and makes a groundbreaking discovery. The stories were no myths. The US government really is hiding the remains of extraterrestrial life inside Area 51. The dissected body of a humanoid alien creature lies on an operating table. Another body is located in a room next door, preserved behind a glass window. Opposite this specimen is a giant water tank that houses live orcas. Some very peculiar biological experiments must be being conducted in these laboratories. However, the most fascinating of Area 51's mysteries can be found in a spacious hall. An actual UFO. This strange aircraft appears to be levitating off the ground in the middle of the room. The government has clearly been running experiments on it and its pilots ever since they discovered it. But what about the meteoric artifact? Where could they be storing it? Naturally, Lara decides to take a closer look at the flying saucer and she enters it through a hatch at the bottom. There are strange glowing markings covering the interior of the alien craft. Another four extraterrestrial bodies are located in each corner, appearing to float behind glass engraved with cyan-coloured symbols and lines. At the centre of the craft is a strange control room or cockpit, surrounded by four chairs with control panels. And there it is. The meteoric artifact Lara came for, sitting between the chairs and resembling a sharp-edged crystal. How could it possibly have ended up in here? After the government's acquisition of the artifact, the circumstances of which remain a mystery, they must have traced its origins back and discovered that its powers stemmed from an extraterrestrial object. Whether they already possessed the UFO at this point or not does not matter. What matters is that, at some point in time, the researchers must have made the connection between the artifact's properties and the engineering mechanisms powering the alien craft. 
it seems that this piece of meteoric rock reacts chemically to certain parts of the UFO, and maybe even powers its engine. The scientists have clearly been very busy with extensive research on the chemical elements in this rock. Both the rock and the substance that runs through it have been dubbed Element 115 by the staff at Area 51. It is unclear how much they've already been able to figure out about its physical chemical properties, but there is no doubt that it can conjure up tremendous power. As both Mad Tony and Sophia Lee were able to prove when they wielded their own meteoric artifacts against Lara. It's a shame the US government will not be able to run any further tests on this unique element, since it has just become another temporary addition to Lara's collection. The treasure hunter manages, somehow, to escape the secret Air Force base unharmed and without further legal repercussions. Perhaps being extremely rich helps. Or maybe Lara decided to fly the UFO out of the base herself. Her final destination takes Lara to the Southern Hemisphere. Our treasure hunter travels to a gorgeous, uncharted tropical island somewhere in the South Pacific Ocean, quite a contrast to the dry Nevada desert. Dr. Willard must have found the coordinates to this unknown place in a journal or notes belonging to one of the HMS Beagle's sailors. Although the in-game map claims the island is located somewhere in the waters between Indonesia and the Philippines, this is very unlikely, as the chapter is named South Pacific Islands. Huge cliffs, small beaches, coves and caves separate a vast stretch of rainforest and swamps from the ocean. Lara arrives on the remote southern shores of the island, but has no inkling about where to go next. There are signs of human habitation in the form of a large wooden hut, but there is no telling how old it is. Behind it, dense forest rises up into the mountains. Lara has to cut through several isolated caverns and ravines. The misty, eerie swampland makes it hard to make progress. Then, finally, Lara finds proof that she is not alone. Near a large stone temple in the middle of the jungle, she is ambushed by a couple of native inhabitants armed with poisonous blow darts. Not the warmest of welcomes, but then again, Lara is trespassing on their land fully armed and with the goal of stealing their meteoric artifact. Following the signs of habitation, our adventurer discovers an entire indigenous village not too far inland. The villagers remain hostile towards her, and she has no choice but to fight for her life. <coughs> There is no doubt that, under different circumstances, she would have loved to chat with them about the whereabouts of the meteoric artifact they are guarding. In her quest for more clues, Lara continues her trek into the heart of the island, leaving the ancient temple and village huts behind. She eventually finds herself facing a large swamp that separates her from the densest part of the jungle. 
She climbs into a nearby treehouse to get a better view of the area, but the lookout is already occupied. Not interrupting, am I? Not bleeding, are you? Not about to use this place as a dunny? No, and no. Good. Good. Just don't want any fly-carrying visitors in here. Right. I understand. What happened? Woke up in the jungle with one of those little blokes snacking on my leg, didn't I? A tribesman? It isn't usual for them to eat right off the bone like that. Well, it was dark and I, I never got the bugger, so I can't be sure. Something spooky is in that jungle. Our air carrier crashed up in the mountains. Every night some of my men would vanish without trace. Others fled in fear. Then this happened. So I brought the men down to shore for safety. Only for us all to be captured by this greedy mob. Some sort of sacrifice to their god who lives up in the hills. Though it seems I've not been invited to the barbie. Maybe you're the dessert. Ripe flesh can be a bit of a delicacy around here. For real? Listen, we'd better get you out of here. Do you know how the tribe crossed the swamp down there? Which stones they tread on? Yeah, but, uh, I'm staying put. With this wound, I'd be like a fill-up station to every diseased bug in the bush. I'd rather be the main course of the real feast. Hey, if you see any of my men alive in there, direct them to the North Shore, will you? Away from here. Of course. Using the crudely drawn map of the swamp in front of her, she manages to cross it without a problem and arrives in the sinister, uncharted rainforest the Australian spoke of. How did these Australian troops come to crash on the island at the same time Lara was there? Judging by the fact that she doesn't ask the man himself, she either knows the reason already or simply doesn't care. Perhaps her commissioner sent more people to the island, in which case he might know more about the place than he was willing to admit to Lara. Dr Willard might well have hired or diverted a squadron from the Australian military to wipe out the indigenous tribe inhabiting the island, leaving the treasure hunting part of the job to Lara. The scientist might have a darker, more ruthless side that he has kept hidden. There is one thing, however, that even Willard could not have anticipated. An obstacle that the Australian soldiers were overwhelmed by, but that poses no great threat to Lara. The dense thicket of the rainforest is home to several dinosaurs. There could, in theory, be a remote chance that these creatures naturally survived in this forgotten tropical paradise as it drifted off into the ocean over millions of years' worth of tectonic shifts. Indeed, Lara already made the acquaintance of a Tyrannosaurus rex and several raptors years ago in a similarly isolated ecosystem deep in the Peruvian Andes. Those dinosaurs were likely the result of genetic evolutionary experiments conducted by the ancient fictional civilization of Atlantis. Were some of their scientific masterminds involved in the South Pacific too? Did they visit the island at some point in time? Or is some other force at work here? What if the power contained in a piece of meteoric rock, the powerful element 115, had something to do with their existence? <laughs> Lara will find out more about the element's enigmatic properties very soon. She makes her way past the crash site of the Australian air carrier. Several of the soldiers have survived and help Lara fend off the dinosaurs. Beyond the plane wreckage and the jungle lies another, larger stone temple built by the Polynesian tribe. Lara decides to pay it a visit. 
Inside, she approaches a huge mural showing scenes from the tribe's history. Is well for you, me fast in this day. You make plenty good flesh pot. You forget. I might be quite hungry myself. Famished, actually. Uh. Why did your ancestors flee from Antarctica so suddenly? Oh. Kuma, Kuma, bad place. Plenty flesh. But for the price of evil, mutilation, the sixth leader, Mauki, were born without a face. Terrible storms. Men afraid. Run! Set curse of Mauki on the land. No one good enough. But you still worship it? White fella later come here with magic Kuma Kuma stone. In a day, we celebrate the death of him, the Feast of Smile. One of Darwin's sailors, poor fool. Where's the stone now? He lucky fella that kill you. A plenty merry like you. I'll be sure to point that out to him. After learning the full truth from the native, we can put the missing historical and scientific pieces together. The man mentioned that in ancient times, when his ancestors still inhabited Antarctica, the meteorite had a degenerating effect on their people. After they settled in proximity to the meteor and started worshipping it, generation after generation became more affected by its powers. So much so that their sixth king, Mauki, was born without a face. This strongly implies that the meteorite emits unfathomable amounts of radiation, altering the DNA of every living being. Lara has already witnessed this effect multiple times by this point. When Willard's researcher, Tony, impaled himself with the meteoric Infada stone back in India, the effects of this radiation were greatly increased, resulting in his superhuman abilities. Sophia Lee also abused the radioactive element 115 within the Eye of Isis to modify her cosmetics products. After years of her special treatment, the poisoned victims gradually suffered the same fate as the Polynesians before they fled their home and spread out over the ocean. Radiation powerful enough to alter and enhance biological evolution? This sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Just as the Atlanteans used their technology to meddle with evolution, Element 115 seems capable of doing the same thing. Perhaps the ancient super-civilization once harvested the radioactive element, using it to power their mechanisms and machinery until all their knowledge was forgotten. Now, the fourth artifact is once again possessed by the descendants of the indigenous Antarctic tribe, having been brought to the island by one of Darwin's sailors. When the native refuses to tell Lara the artifact's whereabouts, she follows her gut feeling, and the captains hint that the tribe seemed to worship some sort of deity up in the hills. She steps outside via the back entrance of the temple, and comes face to face with dangerous rapids running through the steep chasms of the mountain range, known by the locals as Madubu Gorge. Luckily, Lara is evidently not the first visitor to these hills, as she finds a modern kayak parked in the river near the temple. She boards the convenient watercraft and lets the white water of the river carry her deeper into the mountains, towards the supposed god's sanctuary. The stream leads our adventurer into a vast system of caverns littered with ancient structures and traps. 
She traverses the treacherous area in the hopes that she can locate an entrance to the innermost temple. By operating a large and complicated plug mechanism in the cave, the water inside drains down into an underground chamber. This area hides an entrance into the temple. Situated inside are several richly decorated, but dimly lit, hallways. The architecture of the structure is covered with gruesome-looking human skulls, making it evident that intruders are not welcome. Nothing much is known about the origins of the Austronesians who inhabit the island, other than they are descendants of the people that once settled in Antarctica. It is not known if this isolated tribe was ever in economic or political contact with any other island cultures in Polynesia. However, some scattered artworks on the island, especially near and inside the temples, suggest at least some cultural exchange which influenced their art styles and religious beliefs. Various accumulated art styles and sculptural elements can be found. A hint to their cultural background can be found in the name of the temple Lara is currently exploring. It is known as the Temple of Puna, likely referring to the king that resides in it, and who is being worshipped as a god by his people. Puna is a figure from the Polynesian mythology of the Tuamoto Islands in French Polynesia. The archipelago was settled by Polynesians in the 8th century CE. If anything, the name, or at least the concept, of Puna must have made its way from Tuamoto to the tribe residing on this unknown island. It is unclear whether this fictional Puna is the same king the temple was originally dedicated to, or if he is just a descendant of the original leader. However, knowing now what the radioactive material within the meteorite is capable of, it isn't too far-fetched to assume the man named Puna has become an undying god to his followers. Lara enters a grand hall within the temple and meets the inhuman king herself. <laughs> After a tedious battle, Lara defeats Puna, resulting in his dissolution. He leaves behind the artifact that the locals have dubbed the Aura Dagger. It is shaped like a sharp-edged lizard. Quite an ironic coincidence considering the local fauna. With the fourth and final meteorite artifact in her possession, Lara is ready to deliver them to her commissioner. However, she has surely developed some doubts by this point. Is it really a smart move to return the artifacts to Willard, knowing that the ruthless scientist undoubtedly knows about its otherworldly levels of radioactivity? Well, a deal's a deal. While his client was busy fetching the meteoric pieces from all over the world, Mark Willard retreated to his company's mining base on the Antarctic continent. There, RX Tech had been busy unearthing the remains of the Polynesian civilization that settled in and around the meteorite crater. Lara is offered a ride in one of Dr. Willard's helicopters that takes her further inland deeper into the frozen continent. This is Amlux to base. Come in, base. Come in, base. Dead air, man. We've got to get down. This is too much.
After the pilot dies in the crash, Lara is stranded alone in the perishing cold. However, under the circumstances, she is lucky. The helicopter has crashed not far from Dr. Willard's RX Tech mining facility. She quickly locates the RX Explorer, the company's icebreaker vessel, which is stuck in a dense field of ice flows. Upon entering the large ship, she is ambushed by Willard's employees, who attack her without warning. Lara escapes using one of the ship's inflatable rescue boats, and travels further into the frozen wasteland, into the heart of the mining installation. Before she can confront Willard about his trigger-happy team, the RX Tech employee's hostile attitude is explained by a shocking discovery. What on earth has happened to this research base? The other RX Tech employees must surely be terrified and are perhaps trying to escape the mining facility. Lara finally tracks Willard down to a small lodge. It is time for some answers. Oh, hi, come in. Make yourself at home. I, I won't be a minute. At home? I've just met a man who may as well have been Brundlefly. Fascinating, isn't it? He was your own employee. He was a molecular biologist. He'd have been intrigued with himself. Thanks to this material, his Hox genes were multiplied. Do that, and the complexities of our bodies increase beyond our comprehension. But this is just the fringe of its possibilities we're seeing here. My pal's exposure came from the material impregnated into the meteorite crater. The real capacities lie in its core, which these artifacts you're so attached to will let me access. But you've no control over this. This is not just about avidly spawning mutants. It's an entirely natural acceleration of evolution, a real live laboratory of spurred on life. Not everyone here wants to be guinea pigs, multi-appendaged or not. Well, that's unfortunate. It's been hit and miss here for too long. Now the timing's spot on, I can't leave it. The Polynesians fled in their ignorance. Darwin's half-wit sailors the same, ironically making Darwin himself miss this angle on evolution. But now, I'm here. I have the access, the knowledge, the artifacts. Yes, but you bumped into me in India and sent me to find them for you, bringing me here. Listen to this gibberish. Your perception of good timing is bad. I don't know about that. <laughs> Thank you. 
after things have gone south, and Lara finally understands the megalomaniacal scientist's true ambitions, our treasure hunter realises she can't let him escape with the meteoric artefacts. She knows all too well what meddling with human evolution can lead to, recalling her past encounter with the villainous Jacqueline Natler, who nurtured similar, albeit more well-structured, genocidal and world-dominating goals. Lara follows Willard underground into the countless mining tunnels RX Tech has been digging for an unknown amount of time. Scattered throughout the caverns is a vast system of mining tracks, frameworks, and countless pieces of mining equipment, making navigation through the tunnels quick and efficient. Lara follows the tunnels and meets more unlucky, disfigured employees along the way. also meets a team of workers equipped with flamethrowers, tasked with clearing the mutated creatures out of the tunnels. They can't have gotten wind of the chaos above ground. Their lack of hostility towards Lara suggests that they believe she is still Dr. Willard's accomplice. <laughs> Lara finally arrives at the frozen heart of the ancient Polynesian civilization. Scattered throughout a large cave are more of the Moa-inspired statues, the huge monolithic statues in the form of human heads that can also be found above ground. The real-life Moai were erected by the Rapa Nui people sometime between the 13th and 15th centuries on Easter Island in eastern Polynesia. They are meant to represent the faces of their deified ancestors. This tradition could very well stem from the fictional ancient Polynesian civilization that Lara has encountered here in Antarctica. It is possible that these people carried their religious beliefs and traditions with them after they fled their temporary home in Antarctica and sailed across the Pacific Ocean. Some of these cultural practices might have been adopted by other Austronesian peoples throughout the ages and across the Pacific Islands. Next to the statues is an enormous stone wall surrounded by ice. This was once one of the outer walls of the lost city of Tinos, the Polynesian's home on this cold continent. RX Tech has managed to dig a way through the thick frozen walls and into the city. The part of the city made accessible through the company's mining work seems to include some kind of temple structure. There are many tall, intimidating statues, as well as other artworks and depictions, to be found in these stone halls. Signs of former habitation are scarce which supports the South Pacific Islanders' tale of the sudden departure of the city's inhabitants. In addition to the unique monumental architecture, Lara comes across several ritual masks. When Lara explores a large area, however, she realizes she is not entirely alone. The former Polynesian inhabitants do still dwell in the Forgotten City, but not in their original human form. <laughs> After centuries of exposure to the meteorite's devastating radiation, their appearance has altered beyond recognition. 
Curiously, there are also giant mutated flying insects nesting within the ruins. These interesting insects must have evolved from the Belgica Antarctica, the Antarctic midge, the only known insect on the entire continent of Antarctica. Our adventurer defends herself against the creatures and navigates the ancient city in search of Dr. Willard. The chambers within the sanctuary hold fascinating discoveries. For example, one room is dedicated to each of the four elements. The ancient Polynesians must have connected the powers of the meteorite they worshipped to their nature-based worldview. They recognised aspects of fire, water, earth and air in the large extraterrestrial debris and must have considered it a reflection of their beliefs. The whole temple seems to be dedicated entirely to the meteorite and was likely constructed for purposes of ritualistic worship. At the bottom of the structure, in its very heart, the remains of the meteorite are still present. The inhabitants of Tinos have converted the entire original crater into an enormous ritual chamber. Upon arriving there, Lara recognises Dr. Willard in the centre of the hall and rushes towards her former commissioner. crazed scientist must have lost his senses as he throws himself into a pool of liquefied meteorite substance, presumably element 115, in its raw form. He emerges from the crater as a grotesque, spider-like monstrosity, ready to annihilate everything in his path. Together with the four meteorite artefacts Lara has collected and delivered, he is exposed to the maximum dose of radiation. It is unclear why Dr. Willard required these artefact pieces, given that a large part of the original meteorite is still intact inside of the cavern. Perhaps, after centuries of being subjected to the freezing cold of Antarctica, its powers had faded, whereas the substance embedded in the four artefacts could have remained as fresh as ever. Lara has no time to wait around. With the four artefacts in her backpack, our adventurer escapes the collapsing cavern and emerges in the mining base above ground. And, conveniently enough, a nearby helicopter seems to be about to take off. Finally, Lara has her ticket off the frozen continent.